to the International Criminal Court. They promoted him to be the person responsible for hearing human rights complaints from the very victims against whom he perpetrated his crime. What more Orwellian inversion of law and morality can we find? So while this was a historic precedent, the question is whether the international community will enforce uh, this judgment. And so the history here is yet to be written whether the culture of impunity will be replaced by a culture of accountability. The fourth lesson, and I'll move more quickly to a close, is the danger of assault on the most vulnerable in society. Again, the Holocaust and the genocide that followed occurred not only because of the vulnerability of the powerless, but the powerlessness of the vulnerable. And it's so it's our responsibility as citoyens du monde to give voice to the voices as we empower the, the powerless wherever and whoever they may be. The fifth lesson is the cruelty of genocide denial, an assault on memory and truth, a criminal conspiracy to whitewash the worst crimes of history, as in the case of Holocaust denial, where it actually accuses the victims of falsifying this hoax. And now again, in the phenomenon of genocide denial with respect to Rwanda. Remembrance of genocide is itself a repudiation of such denial, which becomes more prevalent, tragically, with the passage of time. And the sixth and final lesson I would say here is the importance of remembering the heroic rescuers, those like Raoul Wallenberg, who demonstrated the possibility of human resistance, that one person can stand up, confront evil, prevail, and thereby transform uh, history. And we are meeting in Geneva, uh, where uh, Rao Wallenberg's uh, brother, uh, Givan Dardel, uh, resides. And I want to uh, make uh, this comment to pay tribute to this Swedish non-Jew who saved almost uh, more uh, Jews in the Second World War uh, than almost any a single government. A tragic data, but happens to be the case, and that too deserves uh, to be remembered as a hero for our time. I want to uh, turn now to introduce uh, our panel uh, of experts uh, themselves, uh, including you know, human rights advocates, uh, genocide uh, survivors, leaders in the struggle against uh, racism, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. I'll introduce them in the sequence in which they will be speaking. And our first uh, speaker will be Jibra Hamid himself from uh, Darfur, who's the president of the Peace and Development uh, Center uh, here in uh, Switzerland itself, a human rights activist and defender of defenders. And we know uh, what that uh, means when you push yourself uh, on the line in, in that regard, involved in all facets of humanitarian relief, which is desperately needed now, even more so uh, in Darfur, before President al-Bashir evicted uh, the humanitarian relief. Already, 404 million people were in desperate need of uh, humanitarian uh, assistance, and who has been involved not only in humanitarian relief, but in speaking truth to power and giving voice to the voiceless and giving voice to the victims uh, in uh, Darfur. So I'll turn now to Yuba Hamid. Thank you, Professor, for your, uh, for your uh, nice and uh, clear uh, message to uh, all of the audience here. I'm uh, thanking you by the name of all the Arborians who are uh, the victims. I don't know how they are, if they eat their portion today or not. So I thank you all that you dedicate your time on Sunday morning to come up to Geneva here to attend this summit. And a special thanks to uh, UN Watch as a uh, sponsor and uh, the team who were working very hard day and night to organize this day. So 
I'm very grateful and thankful for all of you here. First of all, um, I would like to talk about, uh, uh, I'm presenting some person who is supposed to be here today. And this person is Mr. Ahmed Ibrahim Dray. This is, he was the ex uh, former governor of Darfur when Darfur was one region. Today Darfur is divided to three. Of course, this man is supposed to be here today, but unfortunately he was having an accident and we hope that he is getting or recovering better today. So I don't have contact, but I wish him good health and uh, to cover as soon as possible. So what I would like to say also, it is really he, he was lucky to be somewhere abroad, not to be in Darfur or somewhere, because otherwise he was going to be dead today. Because this is uh, accident, you cannot survive because you have no medical care, you have none. So this guy was uh, really struggling for Darfur for a long time in the early 80s, 80s, and he was doing a lot for Darfur. But government of Sudan or the people who were the power in the, in the central, they were always putting pressure on Darfur and as we know since 1960 or we will say 84 or before, we were, they were always victims for the this from the regime government and who came before and who are coming and coming and coming. And today after such a long time struggling with our people to stand up for this uh, uh, the movement that started to stand and uh, they want to defend their rights, but unfortunately they uh, put the whole region under uh, control of the government, which is uh, true. So, what I would like to say now uh, we are really bad situation in Japan. Really bad, I would say, after the arrest, wrong arrest, the uh, arrest warrants that they are uh, issued by the uh, ITC. The government of Sudan throws all, all over 13 or 14 NGOs of the uh, internal organization out of the region. And this was uh, this is affecting that world very much because I would say. 99% of the Korean are depending on these police organizations who are helping them to survive and uh, to get the medical care. They don't get this now. Like um, I was saying, a week ago I lost a cousin. He was just having normal sickness and he had to go to the doctor to check up and he cannot make it. But there was no doctor to go to get to know what he has. Because all the doctors who were down, they were thrown out, and now the force is left alone without any uh, care. And we're still here sitting and talking about uh, human beings. So we are forgetting and thinking that uh, we are as forgotten people in Darfur, but I don't think that we're forgotten because I see all these nations here, they are coming, they are cutting long, long distance here to come to participate with us and to uh, cooperate with us, to talk with us and to give us some feeling that we are also not alone in our tragedy. This is, I'm really appreciating it. So, before yesterday also I really lost that for an uncle, he was also sick and cannot also go through just to get some tablets. So, And I, I will say this is only me, that which I have only in my thought. I think in every family, in that world right now, they give, they have so much casualties and uh, so much dead people and sick people. They cannot get treatment because they have no doctor down there. If somebody can afford to go down to a tomb or whatever, wherever, then they have no money to afford. So they prefer to see it, they better see they die. This is what we are arguing that the 